Hello, glad you could join us once again uh, as we come together. For some of you this may be your Sunday morning routine, for some it may be Sunday afternoon or evening or some other time during the week. Uh, but we will, I welcome you as you uh, uh, log in to catch up a little bit on things going on in the life of the church here at Thoburn UMC, as well as to listen for what the Word of God might have to say to us today. Uh, there are a few announcements I just want to uh, draw to your attention. We have some golden opportunities. These are opportunities to serve in the name of Christ. Uh, one is we are planning a back-to-school event here at Thoburn on Saturday, August 14th. We'll have some representatives of various uh, areas of the school that will be here to answer questions. We will also have some school supplies we'll be giving out. And I think there'll also be an appearance by the cheerleaders uh, from the St. Clairsville School. In the meantime, we're collecting in preparation for this the following items. Uh, we are collecting scissors, glue sticks, crayons, pencils, pencil boxes, folders, erasers, notebooks, backpacks, and earbuds. And if you'd like to contribute to those, we have a, a table and display set up in the entryway of the building when you come into the narthex where those can be placed, or if you'd like to make a contribution towards that, you can do that also. Just mark your contribution school supplies, and we'll know how to apply that. Also, we continue to have invite folks to sign up to help out at the House of the Carpenter. One of the areas we're serving is each Tuesday evening from 5.30 to 6.30. We seek to have two volunteers there to assist with putting together food orders. We're also looking for uh, some responsible part persons who would be willing to serve in the ministry of helping in the nursery up during the worship services on Sunday morning at 9 and at 1045. As people are coming back to church, as families are rejoining us and children, we want to provide that opportunity for parents to allow their children, if it's helpful for them, to be in the nursery uh, while they participate in worship. A couple of things coming up this week, Monday evening at 630, we'll have our administrative council meeting in the Church Fellowship Hall. Uh, Tuesday, there will be an event at the amphitheater here in St. Clair. So it's part of the community summer concert series. And uh, members of our church will be there handing out bottled water to the folks gathered at that concert. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the church if you'd like to help. I think we already have a few folks signed up. If you'd like to help, let us know. Wednesday, we'll have our second session of Kingdom Sports Camp. Uh, the first session was held this past Wednesday. There was a good turnout. Uh, you can check with Brittany Wendell if you have any questions or if you'd like to help out in any way. Coming up next Sunday, we're going to reinstitute uh, something that we set aside throughout the COVID pandemic of the past year and a half, and that is our noisy offering. Uh, we were in the habit every fourth Sunday of collecting a noisy offering of folks' loose change, pocket money, whatever they had and designating that for a, a, a ministry outside of our church. Next Sunday, on the 25th, we'll collect a noisy offering that we'll be contributing to the House of the Carpenter. We're hoping to designate this to their summer camp activities there. So uh, dig out your change. A folding money is acceptable uh, as we look towards helping support this area ministry. We have mentioned to you that two longtime members of our staff our music supervisor, Marion Martin, and our pianist, Linda Steffel, will be retiring at the end of July. We have a container in the narthex of the church. We're inviting folks to drop off cards and notes of appreciation that we can present to them for the many years of service that they provided to the church in our music ministries. Also, lastly, we've been mentioning we have a fall bus trip that's going to Amish country in Pennsylvania. For three days and two nights, October 12th to 14th, uh, the, the deadline, if you want to sign in on it, has been extended briefly. We've extended it to this early this next week. If you'd like to uh, take part in that trip, you need to get your deposit of $50 in to lock in your place. You can contact the office or check online for more information. I think that's most of our announcements that we need to share with you right now. Uh, I want us to begin with a moment of prayer, and I want you to start by asking, what are you thankful for? And if you're watching this with someone else, you're welcome to pause it for a moment and turn to them 
and share what or who you are thankful for. Share some of your blessings with one another. Go ahead and take a moment. I'll be here when you come back. Some of the things that I'm thankful for, uh, for sunshine, for friends, for family, for our five senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. You only have to have some malady that causes you to lessen or lose one of those senses to realize how precious and important they are in life. What would life be without the fragrance of a rose, without the sound of a child's laughter, without the taste of that first tomato out of the garden? Thank God for the blessings that he gives us every day. We have a, a number of prayer concerns. Uh, let me just share a couple with you. Uh, keep Mel and Sally Seabright in your prayers. Mel had some surgery recently and is home recuperating. We'll be, have some, be having some further testing. For Harriet Moon, this is uh, Bill Moon's mother whose health is declining. Uh, for Ray and Barb Iben. Uh, for Marion Martin and Linda Steffel as they look towards retirement. For Scott Thornburg, this would be Jane's nephew who has some health concerns. For Elizabeth Fox as she finishes up her basic training in the U.S. Navy. For Stephen and Lynn as Stephen is uh, in an institution battling Parkinson's disease for his wife, Lynn. I'm sure there are other concerns you may have on your heart. I invite you in these next moments to lift them before God as we pause for a moment of prayer. Thank you, Lord. The gift of this day, the gift of each other, for all your many blessings, for the gift of yourself offered to us. Guide my faltering words Give us ears to hear what you would say to us this day as we hear the word of God and listen for the whisper of your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Our gospel reading is from the sixth chapter of Mark's gospel. The past several weeks we've been progressing through Mark. Chapter 6, and, and I'm going to be reading verses 30 to 34, and then we're going to jump over to verses 53 to 56. Uh, hear the word of God. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat towards a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. When they'd crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched were healed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be. God. I've entitled my message today, Returning to the Source, Finding Quiet Places in a Hectic World. Returning to the Source. Years ago, while serving in my first pastoral appointment, I had the opportunity to go on a mission work team to the tiny island of Nevis, West Indies in the Caribbean. Nevis is part of Nevis St. Kitts, one of the smallest nations in our hemisphere. Our project while on the island was to replace the roof on a church in an area known as Cotton Ground. Now Nevis is an island of about seven miles 
uh, in length, about, uh, and St. Kitts is somewhat bigger. But all told, it only has a combined population of about 40,000 people, the entire nation. Well, we worked on our project on the island of Nevis, and on one of our days off, we were debating things to do, and we were offered the opportunity to hike up into the rainforest and visit the source. This was the source of the water supply for the island. We were told this wasn't something you were normally allowed to do, but uh, there was a government officer who invited us to have a spe special privilege of being able to do that. So we gathered early in the day, and along with a government-appointed guy, we trekked up the long, damp hike through the rainforest and up the mountainside. I'm not sure what we expected to find when we arrived at the source. Maybe a crystal clear mountain lake. Bubbling springs of water. A flowing mountain stream. And after a long, steamy hike, our guide informed us that we were nearing the source of the water supply for the island of Nevis. The source turned out to be a few tiny streams of water that trickled down the mountainside through the undergrowth and then collected in a series of moss-covered concrete troughs that carried the water down to the town below. The source didn't seem all that impressive. It, it wasn't anything like what we'd expected. And yet those trickles of water up high on the mountain were the primary source of water for the entire population of about 11,000 people at that time. Without the source, life on the island of Nevis would have been difficult, if possible, at all. A few weeks ago, we read in our time together about how Jesus shared in his hometown and experienced skepticism and rejection by the people there. And shortly after, he decided to send out his 12 disciples in teams of two that they might preach repentance and minister in his name. In Mark's chronology, it appears that it's while the disciples are out on their mission trip that the news reaches Jesus that John the Baptist has been executed by King Herod. And as we picked up our reading today, from John chapter 6 at about verse 30, we find the disciples returning from their mission to report in to Jesus. I would guess the disciples are both excited and exhausted after their experiences. Dr. Paul Escamilla, senior pastor of Laurel Heights United Methodist Church in San Antonio, Texas, gives his thoughts in these words. The 12 disciples had been hard at work. It was the first recorded instance of their being without the physical presence of Jesus as they did ministry in his name, something we later disciples are accustomed to. They preached, they cast out demons, they anointed with oil those who were sick, they called people to wake up to God's call and purpose for their lives and change their course. Once they came back to Jesus, they told him about their experiences. Imagine six pairs of disciples, six sets of stories, six accounts about their time away. There must have been tender stories, hair-raising stories, heart-wrenching stories, funny stories, children healed, adults shouting for joy, teenagers following them to the outskirts of town, the curious and the quizzical playing that plying them with question after question about this Jesus of Nazareth in whose name they had come. After all that talking and preaching, anointing and praying, sun and heat and dust and travel, we don't know the full extent of their efforts, but we can be fairly certain when they return, they must have been tired. Power goes out of you and like Jesus, you feel it departing. Jesus apparently saw it written all over their faces and responded, come away for a while and rest. I know just the place. And 
they set out across the lake. The disciples return from their first mission, and Jesus invites them to join him and get away from it all for a while. Let's go somewhere quiet, I imagine, he said, away from the crowds and the distractions, where we can catch our breath. Ministry to others can be exhausting. Have you discovered that to be true? Jesus knows it better than anyone else. So he does what some of you might do to refresh and renew after a busy time. He and the twelve climb into a boat and head out on the water. That may be a favorite pastime of escape for some of you. But the crowds keep coming. The needs are many. The demands, the expectations, the opportunities just seem to be never ending. And Jesus, who understands both the crowds and the disciples, senses a need for rest and renewal and realignment in his followers' lives. And he says that simply to them, come away with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. But perhaps you've discovered that stepping away from the needs and demands is not always easily achieved. Jesus loads his disciple in a boat. They set out for some far distant secluded place away from the crowds on the opposite shore of the lake. The only problem is the people are persistent. They see them get in the boat. They see the direction they're heading. And they race around the shore of the lake so that when Jesus and the disciples arrive at the opposite shore, the crowd's already there waiting for them. And what I would imagine to have been a peaceful boat ride across the lake is now transformed as they pull up for what they had hoped to be a distant, quiet shore, only to find the crowds have beaten them there. Had I been in that boat, I confess, I think I might have said, uh, Master, couldn't we just row back out in the middle of the lake for a while and drift? But somehow Jesus was able to look at the crowds and see people. Now, do you know what I mean? He didn't simply see a crowd of nameless faces. He saw individuals with needs and wounds and brokenness seeking healing and help. And even as tired as he was, he had compassion on them. He said they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. Now, you may have noticed that our gospel reading today skips over a fair-sized chunk of Scripture. If you took out your Bibles, you would find that between the time that Jesus and his disciples cross the lake and encounter the crowd. And the reference in the 50-some verse where they get back in the boat to go back across the lake, there are two events that occur in between that were skipped over in our reading, partly due to time constraint. You would find that as they arrived on the shore to the crowds where Jesus saw they were like sheep without a shepherd and began to teach them. If you read on, you'd find in verses 35 to 44 that as evening approaches, the disciples seem to have had about enough. Well, they suggest that the crowds are hungry and that Jesus should send them on the way to find something to eat. The reality is, it seems the disciples are tired and hungry and frustrated. And you may recall, this will lead to Jesus saying, you feed them. And the miraculous transformation from a few loaves and fishes to Jesus feeding a group of over 5,000 people. At the very least, this sign or event speaks of Jesus' ability to take the very little that we have to offer and somehow bless and multiply it so that it is able to meet the need at hand. And then on the heels of that, you read how Jesus has the disciples get back in the boat again and he sends them on their way back across the lake towards Bethsaida while he remains on shore to dismiss the crowds. In other words, he was the bait to hold the crowd's attention so the disciples could make their getaway. And after sending the disciples out across the lake, Jesus goes up on a mountainside 
and spends time in prayer throughout much of the night. Meanwhile, the disciples in that little boat on that big lake are having a hard time of it. The wind was against them. They were straining at the oars to make any headway, in danger of being swamped. Jesus was not unaware of their predicament. And just before dawn, Jesus goes out to them, walking on the water. Needless to say, they were terrified when they saw him. But he climbed into the boat with them, calmed their fears, and calmed the wind and the waves. And Mark closes that episode with these words from verse 51 and 52. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. And that's where our reading from the lectionary picked up, as we read in verse 53 of Jesus and the disciples pulling ashore again on the opposite side of the lake, and very soon the crowds are gathering once more. What does all this have to say to us today? One, in the midst of all the needs and demands and opportunities you're surrounded by, don't neglect your time alone with God. In the midst of all the needs and demands and opportunities, don't neglect your time alone with God. In your attempts to feed and help everyone else, don't forget to feed your own soul. Jesus sent his disciples out in a boat. He sent the crowds on their way home. He went up on the mountainside so he could pray. That's one of the ways he could stay connected with the source. That's how he could maintain his focus. That's how he could be able to look beyond just a demanding crowd and see needy, hungry, broken, searching sheep. If you neglect your time alone with God, if you neglect your time in his word, reflecting and resting in his presence, listening for what he has to say to you, telling him what you need to say to him, if you neglect that time, it won't be very long before you begin to burn out, to suffer from what we might call compassion fatigue. You can get to the point where you don't really see people and their needs. You just see the crowds and the incessant interruptions. Make time. Take time. Guard your time. Drawing near to God. If you've been feeling discouraged, overwhelmed, burned out, maybe you've been trying to do it on your own. Maybe you need to spend some time with the Lord debriefing, waiting listening, telling him what you've been feeling and what you've been facing, reconnecting to the, to the one who called you in the first place. If you don't spend time regularly maintaining your connection, returning to the source, you can become distracted from what you're supposed to be doing, as well as losing sight why you're doing it. I read that an ethics professor at Princeton University asked for volunteers for a special assignment. About half the class met him at the library to receive their assignments. And the professor divided that half of the class into three separate groups of five each. He gave the first group envelopes, telling them to proceed immediately across the campus to a specific building and he told them they had 15 minutes. And if they didn't arrive at that building in 15 minutes, it would affect their grade. After they had left, he waited a few moments, and he handed out envelopes to five students in another group. And he told them they were to go to the same building, but they had 45 minutes to arrive there. He sent them on their way, and a few minutes later, he had the last group of five, he called them together, gave them each an envelope and told them that they were given an even greater amount of time to take to go and arrive at that building. 
The students weren't aware of it. The professor had made some other arrangements. He had posted three different students from the drama department across the campus on the path that those folks would follow. Close to the beginning of their walk, one of those drama students would be along the path with his hands on his head and moaning as if he were in great pain. And then about halfway to their destination, on the steps of the chapel, there was another drama student who was lying face down on the ground as if he was unconscious. And finally, on the very steps into the building where all the students were destined to arrive, he had a third drama student who was acting out as if he were having a seizure. That first group of students who only had 15 minutes to get to their destination, not a one of them stopped to help any one of those three portraying a great need along the way. In the second group, two students stopped to help. And in the last group, the one that had the longest period of time before they had to arrive at their destination, all of the students stopped to help at least one of those perceived persons in need along the way. Professor summarized by saying that hurry hinders ministry. When you're in a hurry, we're sometimes blinded to the needs along the way. Don't neglect your time with God. Secondly, take advantage of the time crossing the lake. You know, I hope the disciples weren't so focused on finding a quiet place to get away, getting to the other shore, that they couldn't savor the quiet lapping of the waves against the side of the boat and the gentle lake breeze. I hope they, hope they weren't so focused on where they'd been or what they'd done or even where they were going that they failed to savor the moments out in the midst of the waters. I have to confess, I've always assumed that the quiet place Jesus was seeking to take the disciples to was the far side of the lake. But as it turns out, that wasn't really a very solitary place, was it? The crowds were waiting for them when they got there. What if the quiet, solitary place was their time on the boat? What if they were so focused on other things and the other shore that they neglected to take advantage of those quiet moments on the water with Jesus? Let me put it another way. We need to learn how to live in and pay attention to the present moment. We miss so much looking at what's behind or gazing at what might be ahead, reviewing, anticipating. Sometimes we miss out on what God's trying to show us here right now. Tell the truth. If we're totally honest, how many of you, as I've been speaking, have spent some time going back over something that happened yesterday or earlier this week? Or fast forwarding to what you're going to do after you view this message, or maybe what you're going to have for lunch, or whether you need that second cup of coffee, or what you might do later this afternoon, or maybe what's waiting for you on your to-do list for Monday morning. Never mind yesterday, never mind tomorrow, what about now? Too often we lose the value, the importance of living in the present moment. Uh, several weeks ago, Sally and I spent about 11 hours in our car driving to see family in her home state of Vermont. After a few days there, we loaded up the car, spent about another 11 hours driving back home. Our goal was first to get to Vermont to see our son and daughter-in-law, uh, to encourage our two sons as they ran an endurance race, but also to get to see some of Sally's extended family and enjoy the beauty of the Vermont uh, nature. But you know what I've discovered? The journey is part of the trip. God wasn't behind us, pushing us towards our destination. 
God wasn't ahead of us waiting in Vermont for us to get there. He was journeying with us every step of the way. Or should I say every mile of the roadway. Remember back in Mark 6.31, Jesus said to his disciples, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. The Greek word used there is a quiet place, a solitary place, a lonely place. A place away from noise and distraction. As I said, I've often read and assumed that what they were seeking was on the other side of the lake. I bet the disciples were thinking, well, wait till we get to the other side of the lake, away from all the crowds. Then we can relax. Then we can get some rest. Then we can find some quiet time, maybe find something to eat, catch our breath. And they arrive at the other side and no such luck. The crowds are waiting. Later, they'll head back across the lake once again, where they'll find the crowds waiting once again. Can't you just hear them saying to Jesus, uh, Master, when are we going to find that quiet place you talked about? Might Jesus have said, Didn't you savor the quiet time we had in the boat as we crossed the lake together? When you find yourselves having to wait, oh, there's something none of us are good at. When you find yourself having to wait in the doctor's office, stuck in traffic, waiting in line, in route to some place, some goal where you're not yet there, learn to value, to savor, to take advantage of the wait. It may be the quiet moment you need to reflect and recenter and refocus your heart and mind. Ask yourself, God, what is it you want to show me? What is it you want to say to me? What is it you want to reveal to me in these moments? Well, we've talked about the disciples and the busyness. We've talked about how excuse me, we need to take advantage of our time crossing the lake, about how in the midst of all of our busyness we shouldn't lose sight of our time alone with God. Let me offer one final statement. Remember whose work you are doing in the first place. Uh, a pastor in Kentucky wrote these words as he reflected on this passage. He said, the first when I read this passage, my first assumption was, when it comes to taking a rest, Jesus is a do-as-I-say, not do-as-I-do kind of leader. He offers rest, but instead he gets right to work. But then I realized he tells the disciples to rest, and he goes to work. The work is not in our hands anyway. So rest and be assured that God still offers compassion to the world even when we need a break. Any of you a wood chopper? We keep an axe just inside our garage door, some firewood outside. My kids like to have a, a little fire in our fire ring when they're home in a nice evening. Any woodsman can tell you if you don't take time now and then to pause and sharpen your axe, Soon you won't be cutting any wood at all. There are two extremes to be careful of in our journeying. One is always doing, always going, always working without pausing to realign, refocus, renew, and refresh. Always busy. Perhaps too busy. Secondly, simply focusing on your time alone. Always reading, always praying, always reflecting, and never actually getting out of the boat and investing your time, your gifts, and your energy in ministering to others. Years ago, I had a friend who served as an associate pastor at a large church. At the church where he was serving, that meant that the senior pastor simply passed off to him all the things he didn't particularly want to do. He was busy, extremely busy, 
He had a young family, and at times he was overwhelmed by all the list of things that he ought to do, should do, could be doing. Uh, I sought to send him some cards and notes to encourage him, and, and I found a card in a card shop I particularly uh, found entertaining and truthful, and I sent it to him. And I hoped it might remind him of why he was doing what he was doing. On the cover of the card was an old black and white photo of a rotund man, probably in his late 50s, early 60s, wearing chest waders, standing in a swamp where the water was only a few inches from the top of his waders, surrounded by dark, murky water. And he was looking up, and he had a shocked, distressed look on his face. And the caption on the front of the card said, Always remember, when you're up to your waist in alligators, you open the card, and it said, You originally came here to drain this swamp. Always remember, when you're up to your waist in alligators, were sent here to drain this swamp. Are you surrounded by people with broken lives? Are you amazed at all the needs you encounter each day? Are you in danger of becoming discouraged or apathetic or resentful of all that could and should and ought to be done? Remember, Christ placed you where you are to make a difference. The needs are many, yes. The task seems to be never ending. For each life you touch, there may seem to be a dozen others beyond your reach. But remember our mission, to make and mature disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Remember to return to the source from time to time, to nurture, to realign, to reconnect, to refresh and renew and refine. You never know how even in those in-between times, God might have a place for you. A number of years ago, I was serving a church and was diagnosed with pneumonia and was uh, had to undergo some tests to confirm it. The doctor, apparently understanding the schedule of pastors, told me, I want you to go to the hospital and get this blood work done, but you may not leave the hospital until I talk to you on the phone when I get the test results. I was at the hospital and... They got the results, and they put me on the phone with the doctor. He said, the test shows you do have pneumonia. I'm going to admit you to the hospital. I want you to proceed through the admission process. I argued with him. I can't do that. I have things I need to be doing back at the church. I have a class I need to teach. I have some meetings I need to take care of. There's some things. He said, I'm afraid if you go home, you won't come back. I said, I promise you, give me two hours to run home, take care of some loose ends. I will be back. He agreed to do so. I ran home, made those rent, came back to the hospital, was admitted, was in for several days. The only time I've been hospitalized in my adult life. Near the end of that hospitalization, it was actually Sunday afternoon, and I, the doctor had officially discharged me, signed the paperwork. I was just waiting for my wife to show up at the hospital to, to bring me my civilian clothes, if you will, so that I could uh, head home. And... I was in my room, and one of the nurses came in. They disconnected my IV. They had me already just waiting for Sally to arrive. And they said, you're a pastor, aren't you? Yes, I'm a pastor. I said, well, we have a gentleman down the hall who's going through some issues. We really think he could use a pastoral visit. Would you mind, before you leave, making a pastoral call on him? I could have argued, now wait a minute, I'm a patient here. I'm off duty. And yet, here I had my medical care person asking if I could offer spiritual care to someone in need. And so yes, before I was discharged, well, I was still technically on the books. I went down the hall and made a pastoral visit. You never know how God may be leading you even during those times of waiting and interruptions. And you sometimes don't realize how important it is to return to the source now and then. 
on that little island of Nevis, those trickles of water up on the mountaintop didn't seem like much, but they brought life and sustenance to everyone down below. Spend time with the Source. Spend time with our Lord and Savior. Remember who you are and whose you are and why he's called you. And listen for his whisper as you seek what it is he wants you to do. May God bless the reading and proclamation of his word.